This is the Gospel according to Luke, chapter 2, verses 1 through 20. The birth of Jesus. In those days, a decree went out from Emperor Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration and was taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria. All went to their own towns to be registered. Joseph also went from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to the city of David called Bethlehem, because he was descended from the house and family of David. He went to be registered with Mary, to whom he was engaged, and who was expecting a child. While they were there, a time came for her to deliver her child, and she gave birth to her firstborn son, and wrapped him in bands of cloth, and laid him in a manger, because there was no place for them in the inn. The Shepherds and the Angels In that region there were shepherds living in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. Then an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for see, I am bringing you good news, of great joy for all of the people. To you is born this day, in the city of David, a Savior, who is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find a child wrapped in bands of cloth and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth peace among those whom he favors. When the angel had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go now to Bethlehem and see this thing that has taken place, which the Lord has made known to us. So they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the child lying in the manger. When they saw this, they made known what had been told to them about this child, and all who heard it were amazed about what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured all these words and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all that they had heard and seen, as it had been told to them. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Well, special thanks to Jonathan and Kate McCormick for reading our Christmas story from the Gospel according to Luke, the second chapter. You know, I've watched, been here about, this is my eighth Christmas Eve, this church, and I've watched Jonathan and Kate grow up, and now they are seniors in high school. And I just want to say to the two of you how proud, I, how we are so proud of you. And uh, just keep up what you're doing. So let us go now to Bethlehem and see this thing that has taken place, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste, and they found Mary and Joseph and the child lying in the manger. In the spirit of this good news, let's pray. Oh God, may the words of my mouth, but also the meditations and reflections of all our hearts, may they be acceptable in your sight, O oh Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Christmas Eve is one of the most exciting nights all year long. It is filled with anticipation and readiness and exhilaration. And even we adults can get a bit keyed up with restlessness and disquiet, a, a, a gnawing kind of nostalgia and longing. What on earth? No matter our age and stage in life, what on earth are we longing for? For the past several years on Christmas Eve, I've gotten to spend them with my, eight, with my niece and nephew. They're twins. They're eight years old now. And tonight, I'll be headed, after this service, as soon as I greet all of you, I'll be headed to New Orleans. And, you know, those twins, they're the light of my life. I can't wait to see them. They're, they're eight years old. And, uh, you know, nothing, nothing's like spending Christmas through the eyes, experiencing it through the eyes of children. And last Christmas Eve, those twins introduced me to a really incredible thing. It was an app, 
and it's a Santa tracking app. Anybody familiar with this? Hey, Alexa. Hey, Siri, where is Santa? Now, I have to tell you, I get kind of shy around gadgets. You know, I'm just personally not all that into speaking to an, an inanimate um, gadget or digital gadget. But I will look it up. I have the NORAD tracker on my phone. I've been, I've been playing with it all day, which may be why my battery is so low right now. And so I wanted to check out where is um, Santa right now. And I was really nervous about this because I was afraid it was going to be around a country that I didn't know or a city I couldn't pronounce. Let's just go with the ocean. No, I'm just kidding. Liberia. And um, heading for Africa is a big continent because it seems like Santa's been there for quite a while. Sierra Leone is where Santa is headed, and Santa will be there in 32 seconds. <laughs> now, if you're a child, I want you to listen up to this because according to my NORAD tracker, Santa tracker, it says that it is best to be asleep, sound asleep, by 9 p.m. on December 24th that's tonight, if you want Santa to visit your home. But don't sweat it. Let me add to you to this that from experience, I know better. I grew up with parents, wonderful parents, but they were those kind of parents, you've heard the phrase, that they would burn the candle at both ends, and, and they would squeeze something out of every hour of the day. And they were, I don't remember a Christmas Eve when we were bed, in bed by 9 p.m. So Here's the rule that I go by. As long as you're in bed when your parents tell you to go to bed on Christmas Eve night, you're in the clear. And, and Santa will definitely come and visit you, I am certain. Well, it turns out that children aren't the only ones who are, are, are restless on a night like tonight. Adults also have trouble sleeping on Christmas Eve. I read an article preparing for tonight that said that one out of five adults, one out of five, will get less than five hours of sleep tonight. And one in three tomorrow morning will wake up between the hours of 4 a.m. and 7 a.m. <laughs> so you better get the caffeine ready. One of my favorite Christian spiritual writers, I just started reading his work about two years ago. His name is Ronald Rollheiser. He's a Catholic priest. And he writes with such depth and wisdom, and he says this about spirituality. Spirituality is just a word that means our relationship with God, okay? And he says that spirituality is about what we do with our unrest. Ponder on that this evening, this holy night. And he also says that spirituality, this is our relationship with God, is more about whether or not we can sleep at night than it is about whether or not we go to church. Now, I'm not here to beat up on all the insomniacs in the room or those of you who may be tuning in or watching a little bit later, but I am here to point out on this night how restless on some level we all are. And that is because all human beings are restless. And the reason that we are restless is that we were made for another world. This world, as wonderful as it is, it is not our ultimate home. This world cannot sustain, for whatever reason, it cannot sustain the deepest longings of the human heart. And C.S. Lewis, and here's another set of twins that I love, born in this church. Just keep crying out, music to my ears. Olive and Catherine, bless you, my friends. But back to C.S. Lewis, classic theologian from the British world. He said this, he says, If I find in myself a desire which no experience in the world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that I was made for another world. And here's the point. If you're a little bit distracted tonight like I am, we were made for another world. This world 
is not our ultimate home. Okay? Are you with me? If you are, say amen. Amen. There's a great movie out. It came out several years ago. It's a beautiful film, and the name of the film is called Lion. L-I-O-N. If you haven't seen it, you can stream it. I did this week on Amazon. It is a wonderful film, and it is based on a book that is based on the true story of a man named Saru, Saru Brierly. And Saru was born into a rural village in India and into extreme poverty. And one day, when he was five years old, he followed his older brother to a train station that was within walking distance. And together, they scavengered the area for scraps of food and for spare coins on the floors of the trains. And this boy was little, Saru, and he got tired very easily. And so he decided to take a little nap while, while he waited on his brother. And somehow, accidentally, the brothers got separated from one another, and Saru, five-year-old little boy, winds up on a train that takes him almost a thousand miles away from his hometown to the huge city of Calcutta. And when he enters into the, this big city, this little boy who didn't know yet how to read or write, he was extremely lost. He didn't know the local language. He didn't know his birth date. He didn't even know the name of his hometown. But somehow, by sheer instinct, or maybe fortune, I would say providence, somehow this little boy was able to survive on the streets, the dangerous streets of Calcutta, for three weeks. And then he was taken in by an orphanage. And eventually, Saru was adopted by a loving couple, a loving middle-class couple from Australia. And it was a happy home, a loving home, We're told that the home was a stone's throw away from the seashore. And he thrived, Saru did, in this home. And his parents made sure that he was well educated, that he was well taken care of, and that he would never want for anything materially. And yet, even in this loving home in Australia, as Saru grew older, as he grew older, He was haunted by his past, and he had this huge hole, this huge hole in his heart. Saru was longing for his true home. And thanks for the gift of modern-day technology. Thanks for the gift of Google Earth and his childhood memory memories. 25 years later, Saru is able to take Google Earth and he's able to put all the dots together and he's able to find his hometown where he was born. And he gets on a plane and he travels all the way to that village. And spoiler alert, ding, 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 I'm about to tell you the ending of the story. If you watch the movie, he's able to go to the village and meet with his mother in person, his biological mother named Fatima. Finding her, Saru says, was one of the most pivotal moments in my life. Now you might be thinking, what did the adoptive mother think about all of this? Well, she was very supportive. She supported Saru the whole time, his search, his journey. She only worried, her only worry was, she just wanted to make sure when he got there that his mother would be there. And this adoptive mother from Australia traveled eventually with Saru, her son, all the way to this Indian village, and together they met with one another, his birth mom. And with the help of a translator, the adoptive mother said to the birth mother, Saru is your son now. I give him back to you. And in silence, They just stood there and they held on to one another, no noise, and all you could hear was this collective breathing. And I am here tonight to remind you 
or to let you know if you do not yet know that we have been given a gift. And it is a very precious gift. And it is a gift that is much better than a Santa tracking app. It is a gift that's even better than Google Earth. It is a gift, the gift of Jesus Christ, who will lead us back to our true home. And our true home is God. You see, Jesus was born. He came into a world that was very, very dark. But because God loved this world and God's people so much, Jesus came into the world, entered into the human race so that you and I and all the world can connect and be in relationship with God. And so the invitation tonight is to make room. Make room for your holy longings. And let Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace, lead you home, not made with hands, but eternal in the heavens. Come, says Jesus. Come unto me, all you who are weary and carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you, Jesus says, I will give you what? Rest. Say that with me. I will give you rest. So be it. And so it is. Amen.